here to see Sherry Lansing. The uh, former chairman and CEO of Paramount Studios. She greenlit <laughs> Titanic, Saving Private Ryan, Forrest Gump. It's very inspiring to meet someone who actually made it all the way up to the top. I think women in uh, powerful positions definitely means a lot of hope for us uh, as aspiring filmmakers. To have such a great role model, it just shows me and my friends what we can accomplish. And I mean, it's just incredible. All right, my name's Eric Connor, uh, and I'm an instructor here, and thank you guys so much for coming and spending the night with us. Uh, so, Sherry Lansing. Wonder Woman doesn't have anything on Sherry Lansing. Miss Lansing began her career as an actress. She eventually moved to working behind the scenes, rising through the ranks, and became the first woman to head a major studio, 20th Century Fox, in 1980. That was not easy back then. It's not easy now. It was not any easier in 1980. Um, as a producer, her credits include the hits Black Rain and Decent Proposal, along with two studio pictures that dared to be rather bold with their themes. School Ties, which focused on anti-Semitism, and uh, The Accused, about a woman trying to get justice after she's assaulted. But it's her work on Fatal Attraction, which exemplifies just what Miss Lansing could do. The movie went on to become a massive blockbuster. Basically, with Fatal Attraction, to quote her, she bet on herself and won. Her success continued as the head of Paramount Pictures, a tenure which included Forrest Gump, Braveheart, Titanic. And these are bold films. You think Titanic now, no brainer. And yet, at the time, it was such a bold move. But maybe her boldest move happened a few years back when she left Hollywood to run the Sherry Lansing Foundation. It's dedicated to funding and raising awareness for cancer research, health, public education, and encore career opportunities. I don't know if Renaissance Woman even covers just how amazing Sherry Lansing is. Uh, today with her, we also have author Stephen Galway, who wrote Leading Lady. Stephen Galway is an Emmy Award-winning journalist and the executive features editor for The Hollywood Reporter, where he's worked for the past 24 years. He is named Journalist of the Year at the 2013 National Entertainment Journalism Awards. Mr. Galway also created the Reporters' Roundtable series, all of which leads to this amazing book, The Leading Lady, which is a perfect collaboration of a great writer and a great subject. Tonight, we have to thank Tova Leiter, producer. Uh, she was an executive at Imagine, WB, and Synergy. Her credits over the years include Oliver Stone's Nixon, Evita with Antonio Banderas and Madonna, Varsity Blues with John Voigt, and one of my favorites, Glory, with Denzel. So, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause. Stephen Galloway, Tova Leiter, and Sherry Lansing. Hi. Hi, everybody. Woo! Okay, so, Stephen, why a book about Sherry? <laughs> As opposed to, let's say, George Clooney or somebody. Uh. That's a great by question. The, by, um, uh, by the way, it's interesting because this project began with George Clooney. Um, really? I, I, yes, it did. I had written a profile of George Clooney, and Sherry called me, I think, from Vienna, where she was with her husband, William Friedkin, director of The Exorcist and Killer Joe, extraordinary director. I was very intrigued because the George Clooney as I, that I saw was not the George Clooney of the public. He's somebody who has great anguish and physical pain and massive insomnia. And <laughs> Sherry was intrigued by this. And, uh, and we talked about it and then said, hey, well, let's have lunch. And then we started talking about her life. There's a sort of irony of the way things go in circles because I'm now going to do another P Clooney profile next week. <laughs> which, and the fact that he wants to do that means he agrees with the first one. So it's not just some crazy point of view. And we talked. And what interested me was from the beginning, uh, not just that she, what, what I know, Sherry was an extraordinary pioneer. When she was named president of Fox, I was a teenager outside London reading it in the Guardian <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> Who is Sherry Lansing, you know? Uh, but it was a different story. And it's a story that begins in May 1938 in a town called Mainz, Germany, with a woman named Margot Hyman, very pretty 17-year-old girl who six months before Kristallnacht, which, as you may know, was really the turning point in Nazi Germany, fled Germany 
went on this extraordinary journey across the country to Hamburg by ship to England, from England to New York, had that amazing experience that immigrants had then of seeing the Statue of Liberty and really knowing what it meant, arrived in Chicago, uh, fell in love, had two kids, and just when she thought her life was settled, her husband died. And she had to reinvent everything with uh, one th three-year-old girl and one eight-year-old girl. And the eight-year-old girl was Sherry. <laughs> um, that's the story I wanted to tell. Um, so I just want to add a little bit to this because it sounds um, like it was a very easy thing. But um, in truth, I had read the George Clooney article and I was kind of in awe of it because, I mean, even though I know that people aren't like they are on camera, I just thought George Clooney, oh my God, he just <laughs> looks so cool and so relaxed. He must not have a problem in the world. And every interview that he gave was always kind of charming and witty and just quick and everything. And instead, I realized when I read Stephen's article that for the first time, you realize this incredible pain the man was in physically, that he had insomnia, as you said. And I was just blown away by Stephen's writing. And we had also been friends because Stephen started the Hollywood mentoring program where, you know, executives take uh, high school girls and teach them ab about uh, the motion picture industry or the television industry. So we were having lunch and Stephen, as he said, asked about my life and we got into this and he said, I want to do a book about you. And I swear, in a moment of weakness, I said yes. <laughs> and I have no idea why, because I spent the next four years regretting it every single day. <laughs> and it's really the truth because, you know, I'm a person who likes to have control. Do you know? I think everybody who goes in the movie business probably likes to have control, do you know? And I had no controls and no approvals. And so all I was doing was answering questions and cooperating. And so there was like a rhythm to this. I would meet with Stephen on a Saturday or Sunday. He would ask me questions. I would say, why are you asking me about that? That's a terrible thing to ask me about. And then, why don't you ask me about this? I'm not interested in that, Sherry, but why not? And then we would finish after three or four hours. And then the next thing would happen. Uh, Monday, I would be very depressed. On, on Tuesday, I'd be more anxious. And on Wednesday, I'd think, you know, maybe I won't be alive when this comes out. So it's all right. <laughs> so I was so anxious about about this because he was meeting with 300 people and it wasn't really until Christmas when I had the opportunity to read it that I thought I didn't have to move to Australia, that maybe <laughs> I could stay here. But that was really the truth because it's very hard um, to turn over your life to somebody. Um, and as I've often said to Stephen, he's a wonderful reporter. He found out things that some I didn't even know. Um, but the things that I don't like about it are true. So there's nothing <laughs> I can do. <laughs> so there's, um, there's a fear about many things. It's a fear of being the first woman chairman and president of a studio and all eyes of you. Their fear about green lighting movies that are budget in the millions and millions and Reading the book, I see that you're not this superwoman that makes all this decision, that you, like George and every human being, have, you know, um, maybe you have to get over fears. Absolutely. And do. How do you get over fears? Oh, good question. Yeah, you know, I think you, you, you sometimes, just like I looked at George Clooney, you look at a person and you say, well, they, they didn't have any problems and their life was all smooth. And, and we do that about people we don't know. But the truth of the matter is, I was an enormously insecure young girl. I had very, very little self-esteem. And I think what I had was an incredible desire to be better. But it didn't happen overnight. I mean, it was a long process. Um, I had a lot of guilt. I had, as I said, very little self-esteem. And eventually, um, I realized that it was really interfering with my life. And so I went into therapy. And so I would say that that was the single most important gift I ever gave to myself. And 
in, in many ways, therapy, if you have a good therapist or a good friend or a good person in your church, a pastor, rabbi, whatever, it can be anybody. And you can really be honest and, and burden yourself to that person. Um, and it's a safe place. It's like reparenting yourself. And for me, I, I'm not suggesting that everybody should do that, but for me, it was the best gift I ever gave to myself. And I wouldn't be who I am today without that. I went for five years. I went three times a week. Um, I didn't start out going three times a week, but <laughs> I didn't realize it was, maybe we should see each other more. And it's like chocolate. It, it's like you want it, doesn't, more. it doesn't end. This is what I really want to say. You know, we're all a work in progress, and um, you know, most of the time you're okay, and then every once in a while, for no reason, that 12-year-old just pops up. And that 12-year-old child that's in all of us just pops up and says, oh my God, why did I say that? Or, oh my God, why did I do that? Or, I I'm wearing the wrong thing, you know? And it actually popped up a lot um, during the book because I was so afraid of what Stephen would write and how I would react that I went back to see the doctor. And I go back um, quite often when I feel like I can't handle something um, and I don't want to take it out on other people and I find it very helpful. So, you know, as I said, it can be your best friend, it can be religion, anybody. But for me, that, that was, I think, the, that made all the difference in the world. But I want to just address something you said, which is Sherry's not a wonder woman in the sense of not having human emotions. And I've always been intrigued by how people sort of contain their opposite. And so somebody who seems so confident and diplomatic and gracious actually is often not confident at all and very opinionated because we often disguise our interior selves to present the world. But here's what's exceptional about Sherry's story. There were no women running studios in 1980. There were no people talking about women running studios. Uh, there was one woman producer, I think, Julia Phillips, of, of any significance. But she was partnered with a man. And, and she was partnered with a, a man. Uh, so you have to be extraordinary to break those barriers. It, astonishing. And I, I think the book reveals how Sherry does. Which is several gifts. One of them is just not letting these attacks land on you. It's extraordinary how Sherry. Here's doesn't. what I really want to know because you have worked successfully with some of the toughest, most difficult, and volatile men in the business. So, how did you do that? No, she yeah. has a partner at Paramount, and we have another mm -hmm. friend, Ruth. And she used to say when she had to go and talk to Jonathan Dolgen and he starts screaming, she just couldn't recover from it for weeks. And I asked you and you said, oh, it's like back, back, uh, so background I, noise I to think, me. I, I think, I think <laughs> that's what, what she said. No, the but most it is. volatile man. But, well, first of all, I want to say I, I love John Dolgen. I think he's, you know, just an extraordinary person who, for me, raising your voice is like a style. I mean, that's it. You know, some people talk very softly and you have to lean in to hear them. Some people yell. My father, um, Norton, was, was a, a man that was like that. And I remember as a kid, he was actually my stepfather, and so I remember as a kid, and I call him my second father, my, as a kid, I, I, he would suddenly get erupt for reasons that I didn't understand, whatever. And my mother would like kind of look at him and she'd go, oh, oh. Look at that. <laughs> Very angry, aren't you? And she'd start to laugh and she'd diffuse the whole thing. And I sort of saw that she wasn't frightened of it. My father, underneath it all, is one of the kindest, most decent people in the world. And so to me, when people would yell or talk very softly or get very excited, you know, I mean, every one of us has a certain style. So I saw that that was just a style, it was nothing to be frightened of. And, you know, so he raised his voice, do you know, and that was who he was. But underneath it all, and this is really what I want to say, all of these people that are described as difficult or, you know, they're not. I mean, some people are, I'm not saying that. But there are people 
it's very interesting to me. I was talking about this at lunch today. There are some people who have the best reputation in the world, and they would stab you in the back. Totally. They seem mm. so nice I and agree. so charming, and they would stab you in the back. The thing that I knew about every single one of these people, which is one of the reasons that I love them, John Dolgen is a perfect example, Stanley Jaffe, whatever you want to name the people that are, quote, difficult, they're not. They had a style, but underneath it all, they had more integrity, more loyalty, they would never stab you in the back. And I always knew they had my back. And I always knew that I could trust them. So to me, if you say to me what's important when you're looking for a partner or you're looking for, you know, a friend or a husband or a wife or whatever, or, you know, whatever, it's loyalty, it's decency, it's integrity, it's the person that isn't going to turn on you. So, you know, and you, you asked ended up in Hollywood. Yes, <laughs> but there are a lot of those people. But there are a lot of those people. I am. But, but you, you are very much one of those people, and Stephen's one of those people. And the thing, the other thing I want to say is that whenever things got tough for me, there were two things that. The first thing that Stephen talked about, which is denial. Denial was a great friend to me. You know, <laughs> you're going to always react to every bad thing that happens, or you're just going to push it off and go. You know, every comment that someone says, every you have to learn where to pick your battles. So for me, I, I, I denied things. I didn't hear things. They they didn't land on me, as you said. But it was denial, and and I think that is probably it's not a bad thing. But the other thing, and it always saved me, and I, I see all of you who I know are going to have great careers. And by the way, this is a fantastic, fantastic school. And I didn't thank Eric for this wonderful introduction. So thank you to him and, and everybody at the school. It's just phenomenal. We were walking around. It's your work. Whenever things would go bad, I would just concentrate on the movies. I would just concentrate on the script. I would concentrate on the dailies. I would concentrate on the work. And to this day, that always takes away my demons. That always takes away my depression, because everyone still gets depressed. That'll take away your anxiety, mm -hmm. is you start to do the work. Think about something other than yourself, and you forget. You forget that person that yelled at you. You forget you know, the insult that you had, and you just concentrate on the one thing that you really care about. Because if you're in this business for any other reason, than to make good, and by film I mean television, everything. I mean the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> it will really hurt you if you're in for any other reason, you know. Still, uh, you entered the studio system as a reader, and then pretty rapidly you rose up in the ranks um, of uh, executive position when women in the industry weren't even you know, allowed to get in. So what would you attribute your success to rising up in the rank, other than brain and beauty, I mean? I, it was not brain and it's certainly not beauty. <laughs> it was hard work and that's it. Mm. And then, you know, if you really work hard, you need one other thing and that is luck. And anyone who says you don't need luck or we always called it the movie god is not telling the truth. Do you know, I worked just as hard on the films that failed as I did on the ones that succeeded. There was nothing I did different. Mm. And I believed in most of them exactly the same. So I, I didn't do anything different on Fatal Attraction than I did on uh, whatever that didn't work, you know. Um, author, Author is one of my favorite movies. I always remember <laughs> going back and working on it and working on it. So sometimes you're in the zeitgeist. And sometimes you're in the zeitgeist, and sometimes it's because the movie's really good, and sometimes the movies that aren't really good are also in the zeitgeist, and they do really well, mm -hmm. do you know? So I think you need to really work hard. There's no shortcut. And you need to be prepared to work, you know, seven days a week. You need to be prepared to work 24 hours a day. And if you don't want to, that is okay. But then you have to decide what you're going to be happy with for your career. And it doesn't have to be to be the head of the studio or, you know, to be a director or whatever it is. You, you can make choices, which are very valid choices. But if you do that, you need luck too. And I still remember when Michael Douglas won the Academy Award, and it sounds, it always stuck in my mind. And I thought it was just one of the most honest acceptance speeches I ever heard. And we had done um, Fatal Attraction with him that year, and he'd also done Wall Street. But you forget that for years, 
He was Kirk Douglas's son, and he could not get a job. And he was considered not a good actor, and people would, I was there once when we were doing Fatal Attraction, and someone, you know, s stopped him literally on the street and said, I like your father much better. And oh I my thought, God. what wow. is wrong with this person? <laughs> and I turned to him and I said, well, I don't. So, <laughs> it was, but it was like, I just thought, oh my God, that burden that he had. And then, I remember he used to say, no one takes me seriously, whatever. And then he won the Academy Award. And when he stood up there, he said, I got the part. There are as many talented people out there and they didn't get the part. Mm. So what he was really saying is the movie God shined on me. I'm not, the only, I'm not the only person that could have run the studio. Believe you me, there were a lot of talented people. I'm not the only person that could have had the luck that I had, but I had the luck in addition to really working hard. May I, may I um, talk a little bit about, yes, you were the very hard worker, but you had grace and you had respect for a lot of people. When you were head of a studio, everybody who called you, and not all of them were famous and some a struggling producer, but every person knew that you were going to return their phone call. And you had a way of calling people and how you opened up was also very impressive because you had about 60, 100 phone calls to go through. But you opened up and you said, hi, it's Sherry, what can I do for you? Right? Mm -hmm. It was smart because it got right to the point instead of a lot of talking. And second, it was gracious. What can I do for you? You know, so that was very impressive. And I think the other thing that helped, that made you, um, you were called the nicest executive in town is you made it always about other people. It was always about the other people, you know? So first of all, thank you very much. Tova and I have known each other for a very long time. We're like sisters, so I thank you coming from you. It's really incredibly nice of you to say. Um, and now first, what can I do for you? <laughs> so. First of all, um, I like people. So that is just something that comes easy to me. I genuinely like people. There's almost no one I don't like. It would have to be somebody who was dishonest or deceitful. And second of all, returning every call is just good business because you don't know where that good idea is going to come from. You really don't. And you don't return the call. I think that's about the rudest thing that you could possibly do. It's just, you know, my favorite line in, in Fatal Attraction is, I won't be ignored, Dan. I mean, that <laughs> is like, you know, it's just so rude and cruel to not treat someone with respect. And so if you just don't return their call, I think that is so terrible. And really, it isn't about the executive. The executive's job is to find the talent. I mean, I never felt any real power because every day you're trying to get the best script. You're trying to get the best writer. You're trying to get the best actor. You're trying to get the best producer. It is about the person on the other end of the phone. It isn't about you. And again, you are wrong as much as you're right. And anybody who says differently, they're just not telling the truth because, you know, when I would pass on something, meaning that, you know, I would say, you know, it doesn't work for me. And that's really what I was saying. It doesn't work for me. And I used to often say, you know, you know, and I may be wrong, so you'll be able to tell the story when you win the Academy Award about what an idiot I was. Because that's true. And there are films that, you know, I didn't get, you know, that, that did well, you know. So, so I think it's important to know that it isn't about you, you know, and, um, a movie executive is lucky enough to have the resources to help other people and collaborate with them and make a difference in the process, achieve their dream of a certain film. And if you're lucky and you pick the right ones, you will continue to do that for a long time. Um, but it is, has nothing to do with the executive. So let me ask you, so 
even though you were perceived, and actually perceived is the wrong way to say, you had the reputation of being the nicest executive in town, you also had to make tough decisions, and you made them when you needed to. What are the circumstances where you had to make tough decisions, and when was it better to be nice? You can bring an example, or you can be, you know. Well, Stephen wrote endlessly about the tough decisions. <laughs> and yeah. when I read the book, I was shocked at all the fights. But the Titanic <laughs> one is a good example, because that was a very, very tough decision. Which one? Titanic. Yes. Uh, and one you almost walked away from. So you should uh, talk about how that came to you and, and what the decision was that you had to make. So, um, the, you know, I think, first of all, I think making any movie decision is difficult because you're green lighting a movie and quite honestly if it fails in my opinion the only person that's responsible is the person who green lit it so it's my failure do you know and not my success and that's what i think the interesting thing about being a studio executive is and john dolgen felt the same way we are anonymous in the background do you know and when it fails <laughs> trust me you know <laughs> you got to explain it to every board member that there is um, there's there's many movies. I mean, Titanic, you all saw, um, which was which was a complicated movie. Um, I heard about it from um, my executive, uh, the president of the studio at the time, a man named John Goldwyn, through a very complicated way. But he knew that 20th Century Fox wanted a partner. I read the script, and for me, every decision is about the script. That to me is the most important thing. If it's not a good script, you shouldn't make it, and I don't care who's attached to it. I don't care if it's your favorite director and your favorite actor. You can meet with them and try and understand why they want to do it, and maybe they'll change your mind, but um, you have to believe in the script. And I think good scripts all have two things, characters that you care about, and I don't mean that they have to be good guys, but that you're fascinated about, and that the script should evoke an emotional response. It's not a passive thing. It should make you laugh. It should make you cry. And you, you should be involved. So I read the script, and I loved the script. I didn't love the script for the reasons that everybody thinks. I loved the script because I loved the love story. And I <laughs> loved Rose. I thought she was an empowered figure. And I just thought, oh my god, this is really a woman's lib movie in a funny way <laughs> with a great love story at the core. And I still remember reading you know, how her life went on after he died. Um, and, and then I thought James Cameron, and continued to think he's a genius of a director, and that he would do things with water that had never been done before, that it would look different, that the, everything about it would be fantastic. And so we did a full court press to get Fox to choose us as their partner. And um, eventually we succeeded. I, I don't know if we'd have succeeded if Universal hadn't passed on it, but we eventually succeeded. It was being developed by Fox, and it had become so expensive at that point, 110 million, that they needed to find someone to split the cost. And today we say 110, and I heard someone laugh because you're going I'm, expensive. Right. That's like a normal thing. <laughs> that <laughs> was the single most expensive film I'd ever heard of. I mean, I don't think we'd ever done a $100 million movie mm. by then. So we said that we wanted to do it. They agreed. And then we, we signed you know, an agreement that we would do it. But we had the right to vet the budget. And I have to say that when I was an executive in charge of 20th Century Fox, I'd never produced movies. And then I went and produced movies for 12 years. And then I came back and was at Paramount after that. And that made all the difference, because I'd been a producer. I understood, really, what it takes to make a movie. And we looked at the special effects budget, and it was brought to our attention. Now, I'm not going to remember this. The exact number mm. was like $12 million for special effects. 20? Yeah. Yes. It, it, maybe it was 20. It's in the book. <laughs> It'll give you the right numbers. And I went, wow, that's not enough. <laughs> I mean, this is on water. Water World had already happened. And so we said, this doesn't make sense. And 20th Century Fox executives stood by that number. And then we had this famous conversation where I said, well, I just don't believe this number. You have to add more. And, and you told us it was only 110, and this isn't what it's going to be. And they said, well, what is the worst you think it can go to? And we said, I believe 130. And they said, great. 
It'll never go to that. We'll cap you, meaning you'll never have to go above half of that investment, which was $65 million. And we said yes. So <laughs> in reality, if you, when you read the book, you'll see the chapter on Titanic as the picture kept going up and up and up. <laughs> I hate to say this because I feel a little guilty. I slept so well at night, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I felt guilty. I, mean, I would call Bill Mechanic, who's an extraordinary executive, and I would say, I'm really so sorry. Is there anything we can do to help? He said, well, you could give us more money. I said, well, that we can't do to help. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I can give you sympathy. <laughs> I can give you sympathy. And it went to, I think, over $200 million. Mm -hmm. And um, today, you're going, eh. You know, <laughs> then everyone predicted that it was going to be the biggest disaster in the history of film. Yes. <laughs> and um, instead, it was the most successful film ever released uh, until he did Avatar after that, and he beat his own numbers. Yeah. I mean, the stress is enormous. You know, you, you've gone into, you've got to take the decision pretty much on your own. Am I going to spend $65 million, which today is like $300 million. Yes or no, you know? And I, I asked you this before, but I, I said, would you have walked away from that movie? Yes, I think I would have walked away if they hadn't agreed on the budget, because we were very fiscally conservative and very fiscally responsible. I also want to add something that I neglected to say. So you green light a picture. So you, I told you what I look for in a script. And then, I t then you try, once you've got the script, you have to put the right elements together. You have to... You know, get the right director, the right actor, and if they're not there, you should wait because a good script usually is relevant, you know, for decades. But then there's one other thing that I trusted beyond anything else, and um, that was my gut, my stomach, my instincts, and I think that is so important because the biggest successes that we had, both as a producer and as um, an executive were the pictures that no one wanted to make. Hmm. And every time something came together early, with rare exceptions, easy, those were always <laughs> some of the biggest failures we had. But, but trusting your gut. Except for one. A, a Saving Private Ryan, which came together, I couldn't believe it. This, I'll, should I tell that yes, story? Yes, yes. So um, we had had three um, uh, w war pictures that we were developing at, at the same time. And we had said that whichever one got the best elements together, they were all valid, we would do. And one of them had Arnold Schwarzenegger, I believe, attached, and one of them had uh, perhaps Bruce Willis, but I don't think he had committed yet. And we were like going along, waiting for the scripts. And one day, I was driving home at around 7.15 at night from the studio, and I got a call from Richard Lovett, who was the head of CAA. And he said, so Sherry, you know you have the script Saving Private Ryan. I said, yes. And he said, so how would you feel you know, if uh, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks wanted to do it? Would you do it? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, of course I'd do it. <laughs> so he said, OK, good, because they do. I said, oh, really? And so he said, really? And I hung up the phone, and I thought, what is he smoking? I mean, what is going on? I said, you never get a picture like that. That requires years of begging, years of trying to convince 900 drafts of a script. And I got home, and the phone was ringing, and it was John Dolgen, my partner. And he said, did you get a call from Richard Lovett? I said, yes. He said, is he nuts? <laughs> I said, he said it, that, that the two of them, did you meet with them? I said, no, I've never met with either of them. He said, why would he make this call? I said, I don't know. And then a few minutes later, he calls me. He goes, it's real. I said, how do you know? He said, David Geffen, who was with DreamWorks and the project was DreamWorks, he said, it's true. <laughs> he said, Stephen wants to do it. And I said, I can't believe this. I mean, that came together so easily. I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing. I never met with them beforehand. I just said, thanks. <laughs> what was and, the and time? And Spielberg. Oh, I love Spielberg. He was so calm when he was directing. His set is so pleasant. He, it's like, you know, we're sitting here. I mean, it was just amazing. And he is a genius. He came here and uh, somebody asked him, an actor, they said, what do you want from an actor? And he said, just show up on time yeah. and know your line because making you 
look good, act good is my job yeah. as a director, yeah. you know? So, so um, a movie called Ragtime, I think in the early 80s, directed by Milos Forman, who's a really extraordinary director. I love that film. And Jimmy, James Cagney was in it. And there was a, a, a very promising African-American actor, actually died young, um, who was in it. And, and he went up to Cagney and said, you know, um, Mr. Cagney said, please tell me your secrets. And he said, show up on time, hit, hit your, your mark, mark yeah. and tell the truth. Yeah. That's not bad advice, no. you know. And the other one, um, for the benefit of the actors here, um, when Angelina Jolie wanted the part, the leading part in uh, <laughs> Tomb Raider, um, and the studio hesitated because there were rumors about drug use and so on and so forth. Can you tell a little bit about how she fought to get that part and what it took? So, um, you know, there's, there's rumors of, um, about, I, I didn't know a lot of this mm. till Stephen wrote, which was interesting about the book mm -hmm. is when you're running a company, you're often sheltered from a lot of stuff. Sheltered from a lot of the fun. You're sheltered <laughs> from a lot of because you're in your office just doing all this stuff. But you're sheltered from a lot of the problems. So in many ways, you should probably tell it better than me because um, there were rumors that she had um, drug problems, and there were rumors from the last picture that she was doing, which was with Nick Cage. What was it called? Um, can't think of the name of it. Gia? No. No, 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 no. Gia, no. She had one. Which one? Uh, the, Gone in 60 seconds, thank you. So there were rumors, and was I Was that get, before Laura Croft? Oh, yes, oh, wow. definitely. And Larry, good. Larry Gordon, <laughs> or whoever was the producer, went down to meet with her and Jan de Bont, the director, and they said she's perfect. And But we got all these rumors, and then people called us. Her father called and said, you know, she's very fragile. And I had met with her, and I thought she was extraordinary. She was unbelievably focused. She understood Laura Croft. She really wanted to make this an important movie. She had very specific ideas, which I agreed with, and I saw none of the problems. But she was confronted by them, by I think the producer and the director, and she basically said, so drug test me, I don't care. You know, I'm not on drugs, you know. Um, and she was drug tested, and she then, you know, committed full force to doing everything that she possibly could um, while she was doing the movie. I think she was fearless. She did most of her stunts herself. She was brilliant in the picture. She has this force on screen, which you all now, now know, um, and she had it in Gia, and she was the perfect Laura Croft. I mean, she was just perfect in every way. Um, what I remember about the movie, which is how the movie business has changed, was Angelina Jolie was perfect. She did everything right. She, there was no substance abuse. There was nothing. She was in shape. She, she did her stunts. She showed up every day on time. There was not one problem. So, you know, how these rumors get started, I don't know. Maybe it was in her. I, I don't really care. She was perfect. So, um, see, denial. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so um, but what I remember is I was watching the dailies. They looked all right. And then we saw the first cut of the film. And we saw it in a room like this, you know, it was a small screening room at Paramount, and by then there were all sorts of fights between the producer and the director, and all sorts of things had happened during the movie that made everybody not like each other. But when I saw the movie, I was shocked, because the movie made no sense. And it was just, honestly, a mess, and nobody disagreed with that, nobody. You know, the director said it doesn't work. The, the producer said it doesn't work. And we all went into intensive meetings about how to fix it. You know, what could we shoot? How could we fix the end? How could we fix the middle? Whatever. But what I remember is when we're walking back from that meeting, a man named Rob Friedman, who was the head of marketing, was the only one that didn't look like he was going to have a heart attack. I mean, I actually, <laughs> I, I was white. And, I, and it was our big tentpole. You know, that was also a, I don't know if it was a $100 million movie, but it was an expensive mm -hmm. movie. And it was our big, I think, July 4th or summer tentpole. And I was like white. And I was like, really, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And um, he was the only one. He was completely calm. And I said, Robbie, 
this picture makes no sense. Aren't you, why are you so calm? Don't you care? And he said, Sherry, we're going to be fine. And I said, what do you mean we're going to be fine? Did you understand it? He said, no, but we're going to be fine. I said, what do you mean? He said, I have spots that test through the roof. <laughs> we're going to open at, what was the number? 28.6 20, 20 yeah. or whatever the number he said, which was huge at that time. Still is pretty big today, but it was huge at that time. And we're going to do $130 million or whatever the number was. Meaning that if you could market it, it really doesn't make any difference if the movie was good or not. And he said to me, you can spend that $3 million to fix the movie. It won't make any difference. We'll be fine. And I looked at him. And that was the beginning of my wanting mm. to leave the movie business, to be honest with you. And I looked at him and I said, I, but I, I love Robbie. He's still one of my best friends. I said, I can't think like that. Then what's my job? Do you know, then I, I didn't. I think marketing is a, truly a gift, and I respect people, but I got in the business to make movies <laughs> that had word of mouth that people talked to other people, you know, and told people mm. to see it. And he was right. We fixed it. Um, made sense. It's a, ter it's a terrific movie for what it is. Made sense. Everything about it was great. Open to exactly the number he <laughs> said, and it did exactly the number at the end. <laughs> So that was like, wow. That, and that's how it's changed. And I think it's changed in the sense that it's harder and harder to make movies if you can't market them and get those spots there mm -hmm. that, you know, and also, you know, so much of the drama of <clears throat> dramatic movies have been taken over by the extraordinary things that are on television today that are just extraordinary. I mean, Amazing. But the movie business today is really about these gigantic brands. And um, I had lunch with uh, one of the studio chiefs a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying, I don't know what to do. He said, Disney with Marvel and yeah. Lucasfilm and Pixar, you know, and in house Disney stuff, these things are such giant brands, and they pin their dates, yeah. sometimes two, three years in advance. And there's no, there's no great date to release your movie anymore, or you're going against one of these leviathans. And everybody keeps saying this is going to change. You know, speaking of Spielberg and Lucas, a couple of years ago they said Hollywood's making far too many of these massive yes. uh, monster pictures, and they're going to fail. And yet somehow, uh, in the end, they're, they're better investments for studios. And they're, and they're very good movies, ironically. I mean, I think the special effects and the directing and the acting is actually quite good. Um, but what always amazes me, and this, this month is a good example of it, and then the big sick comes out, and <laughs> Baby Driver comes out, right. and they're great, and people know about them, and they see them. Mm -hmm. So you can still do it, it's harder. That was, I mean, I, I would, it's, I mean, those are two of the greatest movies. I'm not saying that that's what we made movies that were great like that, but, but what I guess I'm saying is that was what studios made. We just mm. all used to make, you know, try to make something as good as The Big Sick and, and Baby Driver, you know. We no, no. People, you, people made a variety of things. Uh, and by the way, Hollywood for years has made these big movies. It used to be Sword and Sandals movies or whatever, you know. But they were still, but, but people the, talked. <laughs> yeah. They talk. They, yeah. No, yes. I don't mean that to be funny. They were still. I know, yeah. There was Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. And they st they were character movies. Mm -hmm. They weren't. Or, or at least they were being made. I mean, there are great eras like the seventies. You know, I just watched All the President's Men again the other night. Which I, have you seen it? It's really such an amazing film. Uh, and there were a lot of them. Have Have you read that book? Um, Raging Bulls. Raging Bulls, Easy Riders. At the beginning. He lists just some of these directors, you know, Freakin, Altman. You, but there's, there, are, there are dozens of them, not just a few dozens. I think that they've moved, that world has become television. I agree. More. And so you watch, and, and honestly. And there was one writer, one voice in most yeah, of them. Yeah. Yeah. You watch, you, know, you watch 12 hours of, of a television show, it's very hard for a movie to compete with that, because you can go into such, I mean, right now I'm living with Handmaid's Tale. I'm living with these people. I think they're at my house for dinner. You know, I mean, it's like, because they become so real to you, you know, and, and um, but it's okay, because as long as you can still see what you want to see, no matter how you see it, it's fine with me. It doesn't bother me. I think we should open up to students to ask questions, because it's really for them, so please line up. Thank you.
<laughs> I wanted to ask you, Steve, while they're lining yeah. up, what was the hardest part of the book for you? By far the hardest part was really making up my mind about who Sherry was deep down. I see. By I far. could have told you very easily. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then charting, and this is what most interests me, the, the growth of this very broken child, very fragile young woman, to being really the, the strongest person, the strongest woman Hollywood's known. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't, we didn't talk about this, but, but Sherry emailed me a, a, a week ago and she had lunch with a very well-known psychoanalyst and he loved that. And, and, but, but, you know, presenting somebody, somebody said to me the other day, because I did a, a, another Q&A and said, well, how dare you think you can know about somebody and say what's going on deep down inside, but that actually is the job. Um, and the rest was, there are all sorts of stories. Sometimes you have to figure out, you know, did Mel Gibson throw that ashtray through the wall or <laughs> just at the wall, through right. the wall. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, those things are hard. But that deep thing, I kept going over it and over it and over it. Can I say one other thing about that, which I'm still wrestling with, which is uh, the book also really shows you the growth of the film business and how it's changed. But one thing that I never get, my, my feeling about it, of what, what is its greatest failure, is it doesn't attach to a larger idea about how the world has changed. And, the, and, and somebody said to me the other day, Lucy Fisher said, that is because Sherry was not emblematic. Sherry was the exception. Sherry wasn't, oh, this is what's going on in the world. And she, even though she has such a sense of the zeitgeist, it's an extraordinary thing. She was unique, I promise you, is. I'd like <laughs> to come here every day. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can't say, well, the, the feminist movement was going in this direction. She was right now. No. <laughs> you know, there are people where there was no Churchill before Churchill. You know, there, there really was no Sherry Lansing before Sherry Lansing. See, we're still best friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. That's so sweet. Isn't it? It's true, it's true. Okay, we have a big list of people. Okay, let's start. Hi, full disclosure, I'm an instructor in the screenwriting department, and I'm so excited to be able to ask the first question. Ms. Lansing, thank you for being an inspiration thank all you. these years. Really, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I saw every movie you made in oh, the movie wow. theaters in the 80s and the 90s. Um, and thank you, Tova. Thank you, Mr. Galloway, for being here as well. Uh, my question is for regarding screenwriting and we have a number of screenwriting students here and we teach our students for the most part to not think about budget when they're creating to just create however I have many friends who have had pictures greenlit at one budget and then that budget's been dropped or changed and so can you talk a little bit about what screenwriters need to know about writing to budget so I, I think your instruction is right you should write from your heart and you and you know, some of the greatest scripts were passed on, you know, a hundred times, literally. I mean, you know, Fatal Attraction was passed on by every studio twice. I mean, we could go on. Forrest Gump was around for 10 years before anybody made it, whatever. So you should write from your heart. And then it, it's the push-pull between the studio and the creative force. You must, as the creative force, try and get the most money that you possibly can for your vision. And the studio has to try and get the least amount and the most efficient without hurting the movie. So um, I think that the studio will come to you and say, this section is going to cost $50 million, and we don't want it to, and we suggest you take out this, or tell us what, what your ideas are. And at some point, if you want to get this movie made, you may have to make certain compromises in your vision. And that's very painful. But you have to come to a point where you say, I will compromise this because I don't think it's really hurting the movie, but I won't go to that. And people do walk away, and they sometimes never get their movie made, but they wouldn't have been happy with it made the way they didn't want it to be made. And other times, they um, walk away and someone else does it. That's, that's what happened, for example, um, with Braveheart. I mean, you know, someone doesn't want to make it and someone else will mm -hmm. make it. I mean, that happens all the time. Um, and we were very tough on budget. 
very tough, I have to be honest with you, um, because we had a bottom line that we had to address, but we tried never to hurt the movie. But studios will give you suggestions and you just have to say in your gut what you can do. Um, and then you have to be creative and start thinking, you know, I know that I wrote that there were 90 cars on the freeway, but I think we can do it with 40. What's, you know, it's not, or I have a better way of doing that sequence. I would urge you to be cooperative as screenwriters. The studio's not your enemy. They're really people, for the most part, who do really love film mm -hmm. and really want the same thing that you want. I can't say everybody, but most of the executives that I know really are doing this because they love movies. Um, especially at the level that you'll be dealing with them, the writers will be dealing with them. Um, you won't be really dealing with the corporate executive as much. And sometimes they have great ideas. I mean, we had a lot of budget problems on school ties, and I remember Karen Rosenfeld just showed me how to take out eight pages. I was shocked. I mean, it was her idea, she was the executive. And it didn't, we didn't miss anything, you know. So write from your heart, write to your vision, and if you're lucky, it'll stay intact. Mostly it won't. And No, it doesn't. Mostly it won't. And that's just reality. Mm -hmm. And it may not even be budget. They may say, well, we can't go this far with that character or that far with this character, whatever. But be open. Don't think of the studio as your enemy. And then everyone has a line they can't cross. Can I, can I add something to that? Because I'm a, I'm a writer, obviously, uh, and I like taught writing. Um, and uh, there are great editors and execs who give notes, and they're not good ones. That's and, right. and, but, um, and the hardest thing is sometimes knowing, is, is, is he right or, or she right, or am I right? You know, and it's very hard. I will tell you, because I hire writers all the time, it's very difficult when they give you a hard time. You know, and it's not really going to help your career. And, one pro and, and I keep saying to, to people, and I, I, this with screenplays, but certainly with journalism, guess what, this, after this article, there's always another one. So unless it's absolutely the one passion thing like Sylvester Stallone with Rocky where I will only do this, it, it, it is good to, to compromise a tiny bit. Um, I'm just gonna say one other thing about that, <laughs> about writing, I, I, it bo bothers me. Few writers today think, what is the point I want to convey? What is the actual idea about yeah. life in one sentence? that I want people to come away from. You know, people look at the premise and will it sell on the, on the, on the, on the poster, but at the end of it, and, and the, re the really great films do that. I, I loved Moonlight, which was made for one and a half million. I went to the very first screening at Telluride, um, was in love with that film. And at the end, I, I actually wrote a column about this, at the end you, you come away with the idea that um, we're all whether you're living in the ghetto, whether you're a drug addict, whether you're gay or straight, we're all looking for love, yeah. you know? So think of the idea that will help drive it. Thank you so much. Can I also add one other thing? If you, I mean, this is the reality that you're facing. If you sell it to the studio, at some point they own it. Yes. And so you have to realize that if you're just saying no all the time, they will, and I, I can't blame them. They bought it, mm -hmm. do you know? They gave you the money. They will do it anyways, do you know? So at some point, no, but they will because they bought it. You didn't have to sell it to them. No one held a gun to your head. Um, if you didn't sell it, that's okay. I mean, if you go into a meeting and they say, you know, they say we want to option this, but we want you, you know, to do this and this, and you go, but that's not the movie I want to do. That's okay, then there's no hard feelings. But when you come, you at least have to say to them, can I try it this way? I mean, try, exactly. try and be mm -hmm. part of the team. Yeah. I mean, that's the best advice I can give. And then at some point, you have a right to say, you know, I, I can't really do this. I don't understand how to do this. Maybe you should bring someone else in. And then you have to, let's like, like letting go of your child that's going to college. And you have to say, <laughs> okay, you know, it's all right. But it doesn't do you any good. Yeah to just be an obstructionist. And sometimes it's great, sometimes heard, you know, the, oh sorry, the, the, all the presence men, you know, the, the William Goldman who wrote this, uh, maybe you know that, but great book on screenwriting, right. which, which is one of those definitive film books, Adventures in the Screen Trade. His experience on that movie was terrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, they took it, they did this, they did that, they threw, you know, and I, I interviewed Robert Redford about it. He said, he didn't write it, we, we were, I wrote it, you know. And yet that film is a great film. Absolutely. Yes. 
I actually, one time, I was very impressed with a female director who came in and there was a note that I saw clearly that she just, she thought it was a bad note. Instead of saying, ah, what stupid people, bad note, she said, can you tell me what really bothers you? What really bothers mm -hmm. you about That's right. that yes. point? That's because maybe mm -hmm. I can get, yes. solve it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I can come back at it in a different way than what the executive That's suggested. Great, that's great. And I was so, very impressed with that. Yeah. And then everyone will say, that everyone will love that. That's why Toba's a terrific producer. Everyone will love that. So what, I guess what we're trying to tell you is, you know, to be part of the team for as long as you can. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, um, my question is that um, what are some certain skills or qualities that will make you become a better film producer? What do you like think are best advice for that? <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think um, the most important skill is resiliency and never giving up. Do you know, if you take everything personally and you give up, then you're not going to get your movie made. Um, but resiliency, the ability to understand that it's not you, you know, and that if you, I always thought if, if everyone's telling me no and I still want to do it, I must be right, <laughs> you know, yeah. rather than I must be wrong, do you know? So you have to obviously know script. You have to obviously, that's to me was the most important thing, script. Someone else might say, well, you have to ha be able to package it. I didn't think that was the most important thing. But for me, when I think about the movies that I produced, I think about how difficult it was to get the accused and fatal attraction made and how the success came because we never gave up. I mean, they were around for years. People tried to, to talk us out of it. You know, uh, an agent took my partner Stanley and I, you know, to dinner and said, you know, you have to give up on these two movies. You know, no one wants to make them. How many times do they have to be passed on by? How many studios? <laughs> and just let it go. And we're going to put you in some comedies. And I thought, that's not why I want to be a producer. I want to do these two movies. So it doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to what people were saying. But if it doesn't ring true to you and you're the producer, then I would say, I would say concentrate on the script and have resiliency and never give up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Oliver. I'm a filmmaker and TV producer from Switzerland. Uh, my question is, how can you become an um, executive in a major studio? Do you have to do everything for that job? Um, are, do, uh, can you dare to say no to certain tasks before that? Because I think it's very difficult to become uh, an executive in a major studio. Mm. How you create a path within the industry uh, is, is a tricky thing, and there are ways. And I want to make it clear to everybody, there is the studio industry and the network industry, and there is the independent world. And so the first thing is, you, you, you have to have that taste and that mindset. You know, uh, if I want to be an executive, I, I'm never going to know which version of the War of the Planet of the Eight script is the good one. I'm just not. <laughs> You know? So that's the first thing. Uh, starting out in one of the agencies is a great way because you're going to learn, number one, who's who everywhere. You're going to learn about the mechanics of the industry that you need to know. Um, you're going to learn the entire layer of the land and the different elements. That, that is the first step. Um, it's rare that you become just a producer and then become an executive because you're part of a giant system then. Uh, I, I think, however, that, that that aside, knowledge is power. And most of you come in ne without necessarily great resumes, but you may be able to go and say, you know, this is how um, Godfather Part Two handled this problem. Maybe we can learn from that. It's the great thing you can. So, one of my colleagues at The Hollywood Reporter, Scott Feinberg, who's a very good um, reporter, when he was in his teens, became interested in, in watching the Oscars. And so he decided one day, I want to know which films won the Oscars. And he went on a list and got all the films. He went, I think he got the AFI list of the top 100 films and watched them. And then he found out which ones won awards. And he's 
become the, one of the leading experts on that. When Sherry started, uh, first of all, she loved film. Uh, and she was in sync with what were mainstream films, you know, so as you might be today. Uh, and then she got a mentor who was teaching her about reading. And then she got a job at MGM. So what did she do while she was at MGM? She went down into the vault every day and found a film to watch and educated herself. And all these great studio films, she knew. And that was a great asset. So I, I would only amplify what Stephen said. I think what he said initially is also very important. There's two businesses today, actually three. I mean, mm. there's the television, television, and there's independent film, and there's studio films. So you first have to uh, find where your sensibility is. And usually it's in one of the three, yeah. you know, maybe two, but usually one of the three. Um, and being an, I think there are many pathways, so this is where I will amplify. Um, there are many stories. So being an agent is one way. Um, working for a producer whose work you admire. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that was what I, I was a reader, but then eventually I worked for a producer. And actually before I, I, I was a reader for a producer I admired. That was the first job I did, but I admired his films. So this man became like a mentor to me because I listened to what he was saying. I watched movies, whatever. But there, there's producers, I always say to people when they come to me and they ask for advice, I say, well, whose work do you admire? It can be a director if you want to be a director. Try and carry the coffee in that place if that's the first job you can get. Try and be a reader. Try and do that. Um, so. That's possible. Other people become heads of studios from business affairs. That's another way. So it just depends on what it is that you're interested in. But you said you were already a producer. So it sounds to me like that skill set that you already have is something that you can amplify and you know either continue to produce movies and continue to make such successful movies that studios are begging you to become an executive or attach yourself to a producer whose work you admire and become part of that team. What's your favorite film? Oh, I have a lot of favorite What's films. What's your one favorite for Desert Island? Choose one. Um, Dead Poets Society. Okay, well that was a studio film. It's yeah. not well, it's quite the mainstream today. That would be more, Fox Searchlight would be doing that today. You know, uh, I really think uh, everybody's always focused on where they want to get. But you've also got to be focused on, yeah. on the process. Yeah. Immerse yourself in what interests yeah. you. Yeah. I'm always shocked. But by the way, if I, when I've hired journalists, I can ask three questions and know how much they know about the industry and, and about film history. You know, I could say to you, um, who is Amy Pascal? Uh, who is uh, Lorenzo de Bonaventura? <laughs> and who is Mike Ovis? And your ability to answer this question will give you an instant map of how much you know. You need to know all those things if you're going to that side of the business. And I could then ask you, um, who directed Sunrise? Does anybody here know who directed Sunrise? OK, that's your next step, right? One of the greatest movies ever made by F.W. Murnau. Um, you know, so I don't need to go further, right? You know what you need to do. <laughs> Get to know TV, because knowledge will help you in all areas. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Sean. I'm in the four week filmmaking program. And I just had a question. Um, I was wondering what are some of the biggest financial issues you've run into at Paramount and how did you deal with them? Hmm. Well, the biggest was Titanic. That was the biggest. Forrest Gump was another one. You know, we um, tried to reduce the budget. Um, they're still angry about it today. <laughs> <laughs> and they made 40 million each of it. I was kind of shocked when I read the book that they were still angry. I went, oh my God, you won the Academy Awards, you made fortunes. But we really, <laughs> they're still angry because, and, and. Um, this is Sherry's least favorite chapter in the <laughs> book, the one about Forrest Gump. It is. I just want to say, you're still mad, really? <laughs> but, um, you know, I think um, Braveheart, we, you know, uh, sold, not sold, we partnered uh, the foreign rights. So every time we had a budget that we couldn't do on our own, we, and, and actually I would have to say that John Dogen 
really was the father of um, partnership with other studios, the father of selling foreign rights, all that to protect the downside risk because we knew we weren't going to be right all the time. And you know, if you're making a movie that's $100 million and that movie does $5 million at the box office, it can ruin your whole year. So we tried to treat it a little bit like a portfolio and spread the risk with, while still keeping the majority of the picture for ourselves. Um, but that philosophy of partnering was scorned when we started it and everybody thought it was terrible and now everybody <laughs> does it. So it was just, you know. But you're dealing with a billion dollar budget yeah, every you year. You have to. You know, you've got you DVDs, to. you've got foreign yeah. releases, you've got cable. Now, you know, the revenue stream of a movie today, you know, one seventh of it comes from a domestic theatrical release or something. Yeah. So, and it comes in over seven years. So you've got cable, uh, home entertainment, broadcast television. You, you have so many other areas. Plus now, and this is what, what, why Robert Iger's been so successful at, at Disney, in understanding uh, if I buy Star Wars, I'm not only going to make spin-offs, I can change the uh, Disney park and create billions more. Um, a few years ago, does anybody know who Ted Turner is? A truly brilliant executive, very fascinating man. He decided to buy a, a, a library of films and he was bidding against Michael Eisner and, and the bidding went up from, well, now it seems like peanuts, 150, 200, 250. Turner keeps going and he, I don't know what he paid in the end, but let's say he paid 300 million. I said, 300 million for a bunch of, you know, old movies? I'm not, it's gonna take decades to make that, playing them again. He created the Cartoon Network, <laughs> right? So that is what the, the, the he also created. He also had an idea that everyone CNN. thought was insane, 24-hour news. And you thought, who yes. would want to listen to the news 24 <laughs> hours? And there you go, CNN. But I, I, I want to say that it's very important. We never made a decision to green light a movie based solely on the numbers. In other words, you cannot let the numbers drive your decision. First, you you decide you want to make the movie because you love the script, you love the director, you love the actors, whatever, the, you know, your gut tells you this is going to be a movie that you think is, you love. Then you have to apply fiscal responsibility. So if you love it and you think it should cost $20 million and it's going to cost $200 million and there's no way that the writers can help you because that's just what it is, you put it on the shelf and you wait. Do you know? If you, you know, so, so those decisions are part and parcel of every green light that you make. And they can be little ones. You, maybe you should think it should cost $7 million and it's going to cost 17. You still can't make it, you know. So it's not just the big ones. Good question. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. I just wanted to know what you guys love about telling stories. Oh, great question. I love the process. And I think, you know, Stephen referred to that. I love probably was my favorite part of sitting in a room with an idea and sitting with a writer and trying to figure out the characters and what they would do and trying to find the truth in the story and then as the film was made part of the story making is the editing because I I honestly think if I was starting all over again, I'd probably be an editor because I find that the most interesting mm. thing to do, and I just think you can change an entire film. Do you know, you can change performances, you can change the emotional impact. And then the best part of all is if you're lucky enough that the film works and you see how it has affected people's emotions and sometimes even society. Mm -hmm. Social change. Mm -hmm. And you think back to great films, you know, Gentleman's Agreement, you know, The Pawnbroker, you know, films. China to, Syndrome. China Syndrome, you, you know, what you, you know, um, you know, and in the introduction when he said, you know, I, I don't think men will cheat quite the same after fatal <laughs> attraction. I mean, those things are really important when you think to yourself, my God, I've made something that maybe will stand the test of time and maybe change people's relationships, you know, or change social movements, you know. Uh, 
you know, I think more people became journalists after seeing all the president's mm -hmm. men. More people became lawyers after seeing um, uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so to see that impact is thrilling. That's wonderful. And sir, sorry, what do you think? Well, I just have a brief, I mean, storytelling is pointless unless the meaning is underneath. So that's really just the way you convey certain ideas. But what I happen to love, because I love the writing, I don't love reporting, I don't love interviewing, I love writing and just picking the right words. And I love it when I cheat and manipulate an audience and they don't know, <laughs> you know? And they don't know. And I had a um, lunch with you know, Bob Gazzali, who's the head of the AFI, whom I like very much. And he said, the end of the book, it's so moving. Everyone said, I was in tears. It's not the end of the book, it's the preceding scene that hits you. You, you know, uh, the, I'll tell you the end of the book. Sherry was, won an Oscar, was given an honorary Oscar for her philanthropy. And the, it ends with her picking up the Oscar and everyone's rah, rah, rah. But it only hits you because the scene before has taken you down and then you come up like a diving board. And I was like, hee, hee, hee. I never told Sherry these things, you know. I'm exposing myself. But, you, but Stephen is a brilliant writer. I have to say that. I mean, you are a brilliant writer. Thank you. It was a very compelling I was very lucky that, that he chose to do my life, you know, which, by the way, is just beginning. So let's get that clear. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There's going to be a sequel. No, the best is the best is now. Can I just add, say something, which is um, one of the most interesting things about the book and about life is you're not the same at 25 as you are at 40 or at 60. And the reason people in the industry are really fascinated by the book is at 60 years old, Sherry said, I'm leaving at the height of her power. I'm going into a different business. I'm going into the nonprofit world. And the idea that you can reinvent your whole life. You know, she was the chairman of the Board of Regents of the University of California, raised half a billion for cancer. The idea that most, I'm 58, so I can kind of imagine, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of close. But it's, for the young people here, it's unimaginable that you can do that. But it will happen, you will change. So I'm gonna, I guess, we're supposed to end pretty soon, but I'm gonna oh. end with my favorite story about being in the not-for-profit world, because you're so young, that um, I think that you'll probably relate to it. So um, I'm 73, which I know must seem to all of you, and I actually am <laughs> actually not 73, I'm actually 72, but I'm getting prepared to be 73. <laughs> I say it, in a couple because, of weeks. It, because in a couple of weeks, so I can like actually not, just go, oh my God, how did that happen? Someone said, I knew I would get old, I just didn't think it would happen so fast. But anyways, <laughs> that must seem like 110 to you. And one of the most humbling things, and it's, it's about change and it's about age, and you know, think back what you were like when you were 13, and then what you were, you know, when you're 20, and pretty soon, you know, when you're 30 and 40, you just will be a different person, hopefully. I mean, that's what life is about. It's evolving, it's about chapters, it's about change, it's about growth. But I was, I think the biggest problem facing our industry is ageism, actually not, you know, um, race and gender. I think it's actually ageism. And when people turn 40 in our industry, they're considered, that's it, mm -hmm. they're done. And I think that's so sad, I can't tell you. But so I had this idea of this program and when I entered into the not-for-profit world, which I did not assume would have, have, have that problem. Do you know? I mean, some of the greatest philanthropists are very old or people older than me even. And so I thought, well, this can't possibly be it. And I was 60 at the time. And I wanted to take people who were 55 and up and retrain them to be math and science teachers who, who were retiring, that they should rewire, not retire. And this is my favorite story. And so, um, uh, and I don't think it's in the book. Is it in the book? No, I don't know. So I, I will, I just, you have to tell me. So um, I said um, to a group of people that were, in, the that, that, were, that were about 30, the oldest person was 30, 35, mm. because that was the, you know, like the, I wanted to do the flip of Teach for America. 
And they were all there. We would all been appointed by the governor to solve the problem of why there weren't any more math and science teachers and how could we get people. And I said, well, we can get this demographic who's 55 to rewire, not retire. And they looked at me like I was insane. And they said, a 60-year-old person, you're going to retrain them to be a teacher? I said, yes. And they said, what are they going to do, drool all over the floor? And I said, wow. whoa. And then I said, well, I'm 60. Not a reaction. Not a reaction. Not, oh, my God, you, you don't look, look so it. Young. Nothing. Nothing. They had already decided I was 110. And so not a reaction at all. So I just, after going, okay, this is really difficult, I went back that night, and I came back the next day, and I said, and this was, you know, as I said, over a decade ago, I said, so imagine what they say today. I said, you know, Mick Jagger is 61, and he could teach, and if he can jump up and down, then he could teach. And they went, you're right. And then they bought the program. <laughs> I needed Mick Jagger from the entertainment industry to say, to say. So I think what Stephen said, and it is a, is a good way, you know, is, is that you guys um, are at a wonderful school. Your life is ahead of you, and so is mine, and so is Stephen's. And, and you are going to, you're getting educated in this extraordinary school with extraordinary teachers, some of whom we met, Tova being one. And you have unlimited options. And anything you dream of, you can make happen. And we're going to be going to your movies or watching your television. And I just wish you all the greatest luck in the world.